I'm, I'm, it should be um, better, better late than ever and better in late than lever, I think. But um, models are more than about data, they're about structure. The, the, we, we capture understanding of structure in our models, whether it's the structure of a care system and what referrals have to take before you've seen whoever in the, in the sort of escalation of care that's offered or the natural history of, of progression of an infection or of a chronic disease and of how diagnosis take place and whether it depends on someone being symptomatic or, or, or whether it will reach sim, uh, asymptomatic individuals, the presence of, of, uh, of, of active screening that may find asymptomatic individuals, et cetera. These are about structure. They're more than about data. So this old chestnut about, you know, garbage in, garbage out, a model is nothing more than its data. And if you put in garbage data, you get got garbage. That is nonsense, actually. It's not, it's not the case. Um, it, it, it may sound like a nice sound bite, sound bite, but it's a, it's a gross misrepresentation point. I think of the structure of a model, frankly, as more foundational, more fundamental, more consequential to its behavior than, than is the data that goes into it. The data that goes into it kind of tweaks its behavior within a certain range, but it's the structure, the regularities of the structure that dictate the regularities of behavior. In system dynamics world, they talk about structure driving behavior. The behavior of a model has certain regularity, certain orderliness, certain structure to it because of the structure of the model. Um, and parameter assumptions will tweak that behavior within certain ranges, but the broad regularities of that behavior are dictated by structure. Case in point, if you have an SIR model, um, you could choose any value you want for the parameters, but the value of the recovered stock is never going to go down. You can't just bend it to your will. You can't just put in any old data and get out any old result. No, 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 no. You know, as long as you see within broad ranges of parameter values, the basic reproductive number being greater than one, you will see a, a rise and fall that's characteristic. Now, exactly how high it goes and low for the number of infectives will depend, but you'll see that regularity. Um, and conversely, if the basic reproductive number is less than one, you will see it just decline in an sort of exponential way. But um, you won't see any old pattern you want if you put in, any, you know, you pick your data, you can get anything out. That's absolutely not the case. This is why we learn from models often. This is why our observations world inform us about the structure of the model. They help us, they constrain our interpretation of possible structures. We can't just get anything by plugging in any parameter values. No, we can get certain ranges. And so one of the most valuable things that calibration gives us is um, the ability to recognize our model structure just doesn't cut it. It just can't characterize, can't adequately reproduce the patterns that we see from the world. Theory uh, has this huge bearing on, on what we see. And data science um, here can help us challenge that theory because it's by contact with the data, by making contact with that data, that often we then find the theory just doesn't cut it. It doesn't account for the, for the regularities we see from the world and the evidence. This is a very, very important thing to understand. And it points to the need for systems data science, for bringing together the data in a rich way to cross check the model. And we can do lots of things with data um, to cross check that model. We can analyze it many ways, compare it against comparably analyzed model behavior. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my slides, but don't forget that point. If you remember one point from this bootcamp, it may be worth remembering models are more than just uh, data. 
And data can help, therefore, cross-check, challenge, refine theory, okay? Um, because it's not a matter of any theory can get you any result you want in a convenient way. No, no, no. And so one of the most valuable things we could do with data science techniques in general with calibration in particular is learn that you know, our cherished theory and cherished prejudices that went into it is off base. Um, so calibration helps us find this kind of reasonable dynamic hypothesis that explains, um, explains the data um, consistent with the theory. It's not necessarily true, but probably a reasonably good guess. It's at least a, a plausible guess, um, a working hypothesis for, for, for what to assume. Um, and calibration helps us often leverage a large amount of information we may have about the world um, but which can't be used to estimate any one parameter because it's not about any one parameter. Um, uh, it's about a tangling up of things. And there's a lot of data we have from the world that's of this sort. Um, it's data about, you know, the number of cases at this place in the system or the service volume there, or the number of people being diagnosed or, or um, the mean time to recovery, well, that, that's not a good example, but the number of people you know, progressing on to this condition. Um, uh, these are things we can use to compare with model results. And, and calibration helps us do that, helps us identify possible assumptions about parameters that will allow it to match these observations or help us falsify models. So how does calibration work? Calibration is about optimization. It's about optimizing parameter values, our assumptions about these parameter values so that the model best matches some set of data. Um, and, um, and basically we run this calibration mechanism with what's called an objective function or discrepancy function. We'll be talking about that and seeing an example in a minute. Um, and basically, we're trying to find the set of parameters that allow the model to best match the observed uh, data from the world. Um, uh, and we may find it still matches very poorly, in which case we may go back and, and, um, and, and uh, challenge that. The structure. So required information for calibration uh, is of a couple of sorts. We need to specify what to match. Um, um, so what data we're matching, um, um, what parameters we're going to vary and how we're going to optimize this. Um, uh, so uh, I know that, um, uh, that part of specifying the matching involves an error function. And, and, you know, I'd like to, my preferred term for it these days is a discrepancy function. It basically tells us, it gives us a value that tells us how far off are we from, from the data. There's what the model produces, how far is that off from what we see from the world? We want it to be a perfect match, but often it's off in some regard. The model doesn't quite reproduce what we see from the world. Um, and we want to minimize that discrepancy. We want to adjust the parameters so that it best matches that data from the world. And, and to do this, we talk about what's called the parameter space of a model. We have certain values. Um, we have certain parameters. Maybe this is, um, you know, the, the time it takes to recover from a condition. Maybe this is the... Um, uh, you know, something about the contact rate. Maybe this is something about the, um, uh, the transmissibility of the infection. Um, uh, and we modify our assumptions about these to best match the data. Um, uh, to best, so we, we try to find within this cube, if, if you think about it, a given point in this cube has a certain value of the mean time to recover, a certain value of the contact rate, that's its value along this axis, 
and a certain value of the, the um, probability of transmitting the infection to someone from a, from a uh, infective to a, to a susceptible. What is that probability per contact? So that'll be a certain point within this cube. And we're trying to find the point in the cube that allows the model to best match the observed data. Um, uh, so here we're, we have this parameter space. These are parameters that are less evidenced where we don't have good understandings of their, of their values. And we're trying to find the point, the values for these, that is the point in the cube that, that allows this, the model to best match the observed data. Because remember, for each point in this cube, the model is run and output is produced. Each of these values in this cube implies some behavior over time for the model. Uh, if it's a stochastic model, we'll run it many times. If it's a, it's a deterministic model, we'll run it once. But we can compare the results of those runs against observed data and say, how well does it match? Compute the value of our discrepancy function. And we want to adjust these assumptions until we get as good a match as possible. Um, so we need to assess this goodness of fit, this discrepancies here. Um, and I'm not gonna go into this, we don't have time, but if people are interested, I'd be glad to talk about sort of how to, how to find a discrepancy metric. Maybe I'll, what I'll suggest though instead is, let's go, let's go try exploring this within any logic. So I'm, I've called up any logic here, and I'm going to go to help example models in any logic. So if you don't have any logic up, um, I'll give you a minute to, to get it up. Um, but in the help area, there'll be an example models menu item. And we're gonna select that. And then if we scroll down, we will see that there is a model here called SIR agent-based calibration. Okay, um, and um, again, if you're just calling up any logic, you gotta help example models. And then we'll scroll down here on the right under examples to SAR agent-based calibration. And um, I'm gonna say, okay, sure. Um, uh, and here we go. Um, so this is a model which is an agent-based model. So we have uh, within main, we have a population of people and each person has, uh, can be one of several states. There's only one state chart here and they progress from a susceptible state to an effective state to a recovered state. Um, it's a model of infectious disease transmission. While they're in the infectious state, they undergo a contact process where they contact others nearby. Um, Maya had a question. Yes, Maya. So um, uh, Maya, do you want to say anything or do you want to put it in the chat? Okay. Maybe I'm, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, do you want to wait while you resolve audio issues or should I go on? Um, um, perhaps a legacy hand. Maybe it was a legacy. Maybe it was, maybe it was, it was legacy hand. Um, uh, okay, uh, better that than the invisible hand. Um, okay, uh, good. So, um, this is a model, and, and um, the model involves some parameters. If, if you look here under uh, person, um, uh, there's going to be certain assumptions, uh, say, about the recovery time, the average illness duration here, or about the contact rate and infection probability um, by which the infection spreads. And up in Maine, this boot camp, we don't have time to go into the details of any logic like my 
August boot camp, but you notice there are certain assumptions uh, in the form of these parameter values um, for average illness duration, contact rate, infection probability. And what we're going to be doing is adjusting these assumptions so that um, the model's behavior best matches some, um, some observed data. So if we go to this calibration, we double click on calibration here, okay. Um, what you'll notice is that there's some, some outputs we'll be looking at, uh, but uh, we're going to have uh, some time series of number of people over time, it's in this infectious historic area, um, that plots out the number of infectious people over time that uh, we observe from the world. That's why it's called historic. It's some, it's some uh, epi curve of the number of infected people over time. And we want the model to match this as closely as possible. We want to adjust the assumptions about these parameters so that the model best matches that, that curve we just saw over time, that curve of kind of observations from the world. Um, and the calibration process does this. This is what's called the calibration experiment here. And if we go look at it, and I'm gonna click here, it involves, um, making alternative assumptions, exploring alternative assumptions about contact rate and infection probability within these ranges so that the model behavior best matches behavior uh, observed in the world, um, this data from the world. This is a data science-oriented technique because it helps us leverage that data from the world. Right now, just one time series but it could be many time series. It could even be things that are more qualitative, like the rate of, of this infection, of this condition is higher among women than men. Maybe, maybe for you know, post COVID fatigue syndrome, for example. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna be adjusting those assumptions about parameter values to have the model best match those features of the external situation from the world. That's our goal here. Let's go see how it works. So if we right click on calibration and we say run, um, we're going to, um, excuse me, run it here. And um, you'll notice that here's the historic data shown in yellow. That was what we just looked at, this kind of data from the world. And um, what we're going to be seeing and once we started up the running is we'll see model trying different, different matches, but it's gonna be a stochastic model. And, and so for each, for each um, time, for each parameter value, it's actually going to run it. If we go down here in calibration, it's gonna run it five times for each one, what's called replications or realizations would be a more commonly accepted mathematical term. It's gonna run it five times, again and again, and again, and again, for, for each val possible value of these parameters that we are adjusting, namely these two parameters here. Um, so it's gonna be exploring it for different values of contact rate and infection probability for for each assumption about those, it's gonna run it five times, try to match this. And you'll see it trying to match it for each of those five times. And it's gonna be keeping track of what's the best one. What's the best value of these parameters that allows it to, to match up the empirical data. Um, and that will have a certain discrepancy value. And over time, it'll be learning. This is in some ways, what makes it a data science technique is it's learning or one of the features uh, of it is it's learning over time from its experience. It's finding better and better matches to this data. Um, better and better assumptions about these parameters in the sense that they're getting closer and closer to allowing the model to reproduce this curve. 
on average across those five times it runs it for a given, um, a given value of these parameters. Um, it'll be having stochastic, so it can't match every time. So I just press this and it's running. And you'll notice it's running across many different versions of my course. And um, that's why it's got these little things flashing down here. And the red is the best one it's found. Um, it, it, the best values of the parameter that allows it to match this on average. So you notice um, it started with more of a discrepancy. This is showing the discrepancy. It started way up here. The initial values of the parameters were way off. It had a big discrepancy from the observed data. The model was producing results there or a great variance with what we see empirically. Um, they had no fidelity to what we see uh, empirically. But then it started adjusting parameter values and it was kind of casting around. It actually did worse here, but, but then it found a better one and improved it a bit. Then it found a better one yet and improved it a lot. And then it found a better one yet and it's been trying to improve it. I'll start it again so you can see that early on, um, sort of how it's doing. Um, you notice like uh, at this, Point, it's still fairly off there, um, but it's getting better um, and it's getting closer and closer to it. So here we're adjusting parameter assumptions about the model. That's the model output is shown in red to allow it to more and more closely match what we observe from the data. Now, this is only one set of data about this number of infectives over time, but we could have multiple sets. We could have 10 different types of observations about the world, each associated with time series or just, you know, just a, a single data point or a qualitative thing like men or, or more uh, frequent, you know, higher burden of, of this chronic disease than women or what have you. And, and the model be trying to match all of them and trying to adjust these parameters to allow it to have the best match. Um, and learning from its experience over time and getting, getting better and better. Um, this is the idea of calibration. Um, to hark back to our, uh, um, our characterization earlier, it's exploring this cube, finding better and better matches to the observed data, right? Um, um, okay. Um, so, so let's go see a little bit more, I guess, in that, um, uh, in this, uh, a little bit extra features here. So this is called the objective function. It's what I'm calling the value of the discrepancy function. It started way up here at 1800 or so, and then it's gotten down to 108. It's really reduced the discrepancy. It's gotten, you know, a much higher degree of fidelity to the empirical data. In, in terms of the model results. And it's done that by finding values of the parameters that generate this average result here. Um, now, even with those parameters, this is a stochastic model. And sometimes for those parameters, the actual number of people infected will be quite far off from the historic data, but on average, it matches very closely for those uh, parameters if we run it many times. So these are the values of the parameters um, that have given us the best um, uh, the best uh, match um, to to that data, uh, the best match to this historic data. It's told us this is the best match. Now, if this model had had different structure, maybe I'll put in, for example, watch this. Maybe I'll put in. You don't have to do this. Um, um, but uh, I'm going to have a bit of fun. This is totally unscripted, of course, but um, um, sure. Um, so uh, here we go. Um, I will uh, put in an ability for people to lose um, uh, immunity and uh, I'll make it a, a rate of one divided by um, uh, 100 days. Uh, so after 100 days on average, uh, they lose immunity. And this will be called waning of immunity. You don't have to do this, but 
What I did here is I went and I saw the palette. If you don't have the palette, you can call it up with this. I clicked on this little thing here and I dragged in this transition and I hitched it up there. In case you wanna see that again, I'll, I'll go do it again. I dragged in a transition. I made sure it was green here. Green is the color and state charts are the game. And I'll connect it up here um, at the top and I'll double click on it and pull it out and I made it, I called it waning immunity. And, and I said it was with a rate of 1.0 divided by 100.0. Okay. So about in, on 100 days on average, the time unit of this model is days. Um, so, so I put that in there. That changes the structure. Structure determines behavior. Um, and uh, if we ran this now, we would probably end up seeing something rather different. Um, we're going to see something where uh, we're no longer going to get a curve necessarily that looks like this. Now we're starting to see you now, now it's adjusting parameters. It's trying to find the best match, right? It's trying to, trying to match it. But, you know, this is the little engine that couldn't. Right, um, it's it's trying to make this happen, but it it just can't get it to die down like this because structure determines behavior. Um, because the the regularities of structure here determine the regularities in the dynamic behavior and prevent it from getting nearly as good. Um, so the best objection objective function we were getting before. Well, when I looked before, it was 150 or something. Look at, look at this now, it's just short of a thousand, right? It's only gone down from like 1800 to like uh, 944. Um, this just doesn't cut it. This tells us something. It's not merely that this is unsuccessful. It's a failure of calibration is a success of modeling, a success of learning often, because it, it tells you something is off. It tells you, go figure. Something's not adding up between your theory and what's going on in the world. Models are learning tools, and this is how we learn. This is a big way in which we learn. Um, so just further to this point, it's not, any put in any old data, you get any old thing out. No, 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 no. Structure determines behavior. The structure here makes uh, a great deal of difference um, in terms of um, the, uh, uh, the the behavior, what's possible, what's not. Um, okay, so um, uh, let's go uh, one level deeper yet. Let's go take a look at this calibration. What is it doing? Well. Amongst other things, checking for some constraints, um, et cetera. And, and there are certain constraints that looks at beforehand to figure if these are legit parameter values and then looks for in terms of the results of the run, et cetera. Um, but it also is using a discrepancy function. This is the so-called objective function. Um, it's trying to minimize this function. And this function is the difference between the model's results and the historic results. Um, this difference is a sum squared difference here. Um, uh, and and it, it basically uh, is taking the difference between the, um, uh, the two of them here. Um, okay. Um, so uh, it's, it's figuring out systematically what those differences are, squaring them, summing them up, and perhaps taking their square root. I, I, I can't, can't recall if there's a square root involved. Um, and sometimes we, if we have multiple things we're trying to match, we weight them. We, we, we have a weighted combination. So maybe we would have a sum here of the difference, and then this is the number of infectives, and then maybe we'd have a difference in the number of, you know, hospitalized or something like that. So this would be uh, hospitalized current. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, maybe we'd add in some of the number of um, 
and, and then comparison of uh, with uh, maybe it's uh, the number of people who who are uh, admitted to a hospital on a daily basis or something like that, um, or the number of people seeking treatment. Um, in any case, our objective function is describing our difference from observed data, and, and this can be weighted. Uh, it can be weighted in a way that um, reflects how important it is for us to match a given, a given type of data. And so maybe based on data quality, for example, we might weight it more highly or, or weight it lower. Um, so some of you may be struck by similarity of this to regression. Um, and um, uh, there is a certain regression um, similarity. With regression, we're trying to find you know, the best value, the beta parameters to allow the model to, um, the statistical model, say a, a, a linear curve to match the observed data. But there's a big difference here. Um, uh, here, we, we can't, uh, we have to run the model to, to compare model results with what's empirically observed. We have to optimize it. We have to find um, the value of the parameters that will minimize that difference by running the model again and again and again. Um, uh, whereas in regression, whether it's an exponential regression, a logistic regression, a linear regression, other generalized linear models or other forms yet, the functional form um, of it is, is given explicitly. Um, the, the kind of the nature of the function, the simulation models, the behavior is only implicitly specified by the model structure. Um, and we're, we run it again and again to find the best match of the parameter values. And, and that's kind of similar to what, what happens in data science very commonly compared to statistics where we're optimizing the best values for parameters so that it best matches things. Um, what is the difference in the number of iterations and number of reps? Yeah, good question. Um, sorry, um, uh, so I, I missed those questions earlier, so I'll attend to them right now. So the first question was, it's the yellow and red box representing the structured model. Yeah, so, so what this is, is, is a representation of the stages of infection. And so someone starts here, there's a language of state charts. And in my August boot camp, I'll, I'll, I teach these sort of things and you'll find hundreds at the least of, of, of videos of me teaching this, but this is basically the entry to the state chart. So a state chart reflects a given condition or a given um, um, concern. It might be infection here. Um, we might have another state chart on care seeking behavior, another one on um, a comorbid condition, other ones. This is one state chart. Coming in here, you start here and uh, these represent possible states that this person could be in. This is in person. And um, these little lines here represent transitions between those states. So this would be a transition associated with infection. It's occurring because someone else has infected me. Um, uh, this uh, is representing they're in an infectious state. This is if we say they're in a recovered state. Yeah. So these transitions transition between the states and the state chart characterizes, state charts in general characterize the possible states someone could be in with respect to that concern, state chart for concern, specifies the states with respect to that concern, the actions that change those states, going from one state to another, and the conditions under which those actions take place. So this is with a hazard rate, a certain chance per unit time, of, in this case per day of going here, same thing with this, it's a chance per day. Um, and this is what's called message transition. So it's like someone has exposed me, they, they exposed me, it came from outside of me. It's like I got a message from them saying, you're infected or you're exposed. And if, if I'm in the susceptible state and I get that message saying I'm exposed, I go to infectious state, I say, oh man, so you mean I gotta use, you know, 
one of uh, one of these guys, and and you know I um, I, I um, find out that I'm positive. Um, anyway, um, that's the uh, that's the idea behind this. So this characterizes the structure of the model. When I'm talking about structures in the model for agent-based models, a lot of it is captured this way. Um, and you may know that in those models we explored yesterday, uh, like this, uh, uh, there was the, uh, the, the food model, we, we saw that structure. And one I provided you, but we didn't get a time to explore the whole person patient model. We have structure of, of several types here involving treatment and motivation. This is the structure of the model. These are the kind of, um, um, the, the, the relationships of how the model uh, evolves over time at an individual level, the level of a particular person is characterized like this. Um, and so that's what I call the structure here. Uh, it characterizes the, the, um, the governing processes that, that lead this model to evolve is captured in this structure. In a system dynamics model, a compartmental model, that structure is captured in a different way. It's captured in this sort of way, where we have a count of people here and there's evolution among those people over time. Um, uh, this is how we capture structure of a system. The rules governing how the system evolves given its current state, how does it evolve, is captured with this structure. Um, uh, in, in an agent-based model, how the system evolves given its current state is captured in this structure. If you're in the state, you can evolve here next um, with a certain probability per unit time, et cetera. If we have a discrete event simulation model and we're dealing with service delivery and structured workflows, um, our structure will be characterized something like this involving the flow of people through here. This is structure. Um, and the parameter assumptions will characterize the particulars of this, like how quickly someone gets treated, gets discharged, for example, or gets treated by a physician's assistant, um, how long it takes for them to be triaged at the front desk for the triage nurse to assign the Canadian triage acuity score um, to them, et cetera to take down their particulars. Those will be dictated by parameters, um, but um, you know, the triage time min, the minimum triage time it takes, the maximum, the mean, those are parameter values here. Um, but the, the structure here is actually the more determinative thing about the behavior of the model. I um, uh, hope that's helpful in, in terms of what I mean to talk about structure. Uh, what is interesting? The number of iterations, the number of um, number of uh, replications. Yeah, thank you very much for asking. So let's go back to our calibration experiment here. So this calibration experiment will run the model again and again and again, trying it with different parameter values, trying to find the parameter values that allow the model's output to best match the observed data. Right, and that's the idea of calibration. And you're absolutely right that that there's some settings here. And one of them is the number of iterations. This 500 means it's gonna try 500 different values of these parameters, trying to adjust these parameters in some clever way to find the best one. It's gonna learn in that process. It's gonna say, gosh, you know, this combination was really good. And this other combination was really good. I wonder if I could somehow combine the best of breed with those, you know, and find. So it's going to be adjusting the parameter values 500 times to try to find the best combination. For each of those times that it's adjusting them, each parameter value, each, you know, certain value for, for um, contact rate and certain value for infection probability it's going to be running it five times. That's the replications. Why is it doing that? Because it's a stochastic model. So you could have the same parameter value assumption and you run it one time, you get one result. You run it another time, you get another result. Um, 
And so you want to run it several times to make sure what you're seeing is not a fluke. Maybe it got a really good match the first time, but that was just a fluke of the circumstance. It was a happenstance because of chance, you know, it was beginner's luck. Um, so you want to run it several times and five times, you know, is, 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 is at least a start. Um, um, and then we take the average discrepancy um, of those. So we're trying to find the parameter values that if the lowest average discrepancy uh, over by running each uh, five times. Um, and, you know, if you look at this closely when it's running, um, and I still have that modified structure here, um, uh, you'll notice that it's trying these different ones. Those different blue ones are each for a certain replication. Um, and, and then, you know, after it tries it a couple of times, then it, it takes their average and says, is this better? And if so, it'll adopt that as the red, uh, if, if, if it's the best so far. Um, so these are the different replications within a given parameter value setting. Um, because of the vagaries of stochastic, and then it comes up with the, with the best um, the best match among them. Hope that hopefully that's helpful in terms of building your understanding. Any other questions about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, glad if it's useful. Um, okay. So we've been exploring this, um, and um, you know I. I don't want to dwell on this too much because this is the most uh, basic of these um, matters. I did mention there's these kind of tests for the legitimacy of parameter values or, or the validity of the emergent results. We may just throw some more results away as, as just um, not even worth weighing at all or considering. They're just completely out to lunch. And there may be certain values of parameters that are that just don't add up, they, they're problematic. They fall in a certain range that's unacceptable, a certain combination. Um, and there's a way statistically to, um, to, to figure out and not just to pursue, not just a um, fixed number of replications, but to pick a number of replications for which the, um, uh, the, the standard error of the mean um, uh, is, is sufficiently fall, small enough. If there's very little difference between them and the discrepancy value, maybe we don't have to run many. But if there's a big difference in discrepancy value, maybe we want to run, um, uh, run more. And we, there, there can be statistical criteria for judging this. Um, I don't think I'll go into this. Um, we talk about this more in my August boot camp, um, but um, I'll just note that calibration, again, is more than about just tweaking parameter values and finding the best fit. It's about learning. It's about learning to think like the model because the model captures theory. It captures regularities of the system. And Often it has implications that aren't immediately obvious. And calibration lets us examine those implications. It lets us um, uh, understand the, uh, the implications of our assumptions and helps us understand why they just don't add up sometimes or why certain aspects of the situation are in tension in terms of matching the data. We may find that we have to give up this assumption or that assumption. We, we can't have both together, for example. Um, uh, this is what we can often learn from undertaking a calibration um, is, you know, our, uh, is, is how our assumptions translate into behavior over time. Okay, um, so those were some comments there. Um, any questions about this before I dive in to um, a little bit of a, of a modeling case study um, where we used uh, calibration to good effect and, uh, and where it yield very, um, very favorable results uh, for the model. Um, calibration, you know, is a standard part of our agent-based uh, compartmental 
discrete event simulation and, and other tools. It's this way of making sure our model is consistent with data from the world and learning from them. Uh, um, and uh, it is something we specialize in. And some of those here, such as Wade, have spent massive amounts of time you know, crafting calibrations. And our, our models for that are used for um, policy advice uh, uh, for day-to-day um, -day decision making, either here or in Australia, are are used with a lot of calibration being used. And during uh, most of the pandemic, we were calibrating very frequently for a year or more. I think it was every two to three weeks we'd we'd recalibrate. Um, calibration can be done with the same model across different places and, and subpopulations. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, we will uh, if we have a model. Um, and we want to put it in a new context, we're going to have to do a new calibration to make sure that we stay true to the patterns in that locale. So the model theory, the model basic structure, many of the assumptions may translate over very directly. Um, but there may be certain aspects of the situation that are different in this certain context and certain parameters that are contextually determined where we don't have good data. And so often, I mean, typically we would recalibrate the model in a new situation to best match the conditions there, um, to best make assumptions about things where we don't have good data to fit it in with that new situation. We'll, we'll engage in a new calibration, yeah. Um, um, uh, okay, uh, could I please elaborate on the stochastic versus the deterministic models, uh, differences, pros and cons. Yeah, okay. Glad to do that. These are great questions. Love them. Let's, let's keep them coming. This is awesome. Um, so um, stochastic and deterministic models. Most compartmental models are, are traditionally deterministic. Um, plug in a set of parameters, you run the model, you get out certain output, you run it 100 times, you always get the same output. It's totally deterministic. The stru model structure together with the parameter assumptions produce the same results every single time. There's no wiggle room. Um, calibrating a model like that is a bit less burdensome, to be sure. Um, it's not wiggling around for a given set of parameter values. So, you know, you plug in the parameter values, you get a certain output and you can compare that with empirical data, one and done, boom, um, you, you get a discrepancy. It may not be good comparison, but you know immediately what it is. Um, and a uh, deterministic model will, will have a certain degree of clarity to it in terms of, um, you know, you uh, you see certain results for a intervention compared to the baseline, and you see immediately what you're you're getting, um, and that can be very useful. Um, it can be very useful when mathematically you're, you're proving properties about it, but that's not really the subject here um, uh, of this. Um, uh, and a lot of models are deterministic. Um, but um, you know, there's there's also a, a large set of models that are that are stochastic. And why would a model be stochastic uh, compared to deterministic? Well, there are several reasons. Um, uh, often, um, for certain classes of models like agent-based models and discrete event simulation models, we're capturing people's progression along workflow. You know. You know they're, they're, what happens to them when they come in, you know, uh, go through the process of, of requesting help for mental health issues or where they're admitted to a hospital or where they are, they're getting, um, getting in, um, in line for um, help with long COVID or what have you. There's going to be a lot of stochastics, chance things that leave their application to sit on a desk for a while or you know, may take longer for them to be evaluated for something. It's a lot of vagaries of things at an individual level. And generally models at that level, agent-based and discrete event simulation will have stochastic components. 
it's not always true. There's things like certain cellular automata that are called that are deterministic, but but by and large, things at that level of an individual are are stochastic, um, uh, and uh, that has pluses and minuses. I mean, one thing is, you know, it's just a, a fact of the situation. You get variability, and you want to understand what's the impact of the variability in terms of overall behavior. Um, so it's, it's not something which we normally put aside. Um, but it, you know, having that variability in there, um, you could view it, you could be excused for viewing that it sometimes is inconvenient. You got to calibrate it, you got to run it multiple times. You want to compare the impact of intervention A against baseline or intervention A against intervention B. What's their, you know, what, what sort of gain do you get? Um, uh, from intervention A compared to intervention B. And, and you got to run it many times for each because, you know, there, there might be happenstance, there is happenstance and chance events that happen every time. And you want to get the regularities of the situation out to compare intervention A and intervention B or to compare intervention A against the status quo. Um, so you got to run it many times. And when you calibrate it, you got to run it many times and take the average, for example. Uh, and you know that's burdensome and 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 and, um, and time consuming. It's true. Now you can run them in parallel. So um, you could these days your computer is what are called multiple cores, and and you can run things on multiple cores at the same time. And 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 so it it's not like you have to run one after the other after the other. But it it you know it takes extra time. My cores my course were being very well used there, 16 of them or something, um, were being very well used. And um, you may have seen that flashing. Um, that, uh, that's because it was running in parallel. So it's not, you know, it's not like uber burdensome, but I, I will say this, um, uh, it's also really handy. Um, if, because guess what? The world is messy. And guess what? There are a lot of chance events in the world, a lot of accidents of happenstance you know things happen by chance uh, when i was serving our provincial government we were dealing with all all these things all the time the snowmobile rally that happened where it just so happened in march 2020 an infected server there, there was a server for a snowmobile rally who served food and beverages of unspecified sorts to, to hungry snowmobilers and snowmobilers seeking to slake their thirst. And it turns out said, said server was infected with COVID-19 and got this whole set of snowmobilers infected by COVID-19. Or there was the bond spiel, which occurred and attracted large numbers of <clears throat> physicians from our province um, into neighboring province, um, into Edmonton, in fact. And, and they came back infected because someone from South Africa had flown into that conference and visited with COVID-19. And, you know, a large part of our, our uh, well, a, a significant number of people in our workforce were infected because of this, this <laughs> bond spiel. Um, things happen, you know, pe wrong person goes to the dance club at the wrong time and infects people or, or you know, um, physicians leave service and leave, um, people without uh, adequate mental health support in a certain region or support groups are disrupted by chance events and, and disruption. Things happen that are weird. And, and what that means is, you know, there's uh, the vagaries of the world. And when you're looking at real world data and you compare it with a deterministic model, often you're struck by, wait a minute, this real world data is up and down it's showing an overall general trend, but it's got a lot of these kind of nooks and crannies, these kind of crenulations jumping up and down and this, you know, this deterministic model is just heading up. But if you look at an agent-based model or discrete event simulation model and hybrid syrup, you know, generally what you will see is data that looks, it has more of a ring of truth against the world. And, you know, we have found through some of our work that um, it can be very advantageous to take data from the world and compare it with what we get from a stochastic model. And you will see that um, uh, very similar trends of that noisiness versus trends. 
that lend confidence that the model is capturing the essential features of the situation, even though the data from the world is these kind of uh, uh, these ups and downs and vagaries of, of wandering and so on. Um, and so that's useful. Data from the world is noisy. Data from the model that's noisy can be compared to it. And we can better align the, the variability we see with the model and compare it to the variability we see of the world and develop confidence that you know, we still got the right basic theory for explaining the situation. Um, with calibration, you know, again, you, 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 it can be perfectly reasonable to have a set of parameter values that on average suggest a later peak, but the peak can occur earlier because of stochastics. And when you're matching data, um, from the world with data from, um, from model. Um, it can be nice to have a model that will accommodate unexpected time, you know, that, that it, it allows for the possibility this may play out sooner or may play out later. Um, and will accommodate that within its range of parameter values. And we can do that with a stochastic model. Um, uh, and, um, you know, when we look at intervention gains, it's also in the world, you know, if you're looking for a perfect, um, you know, pristine characterization of sort of intervention gains where it just gets better and better and better, you're sure to be disappointed uh, in the world because sometimes it's much more um, variable uh, than that. And people can be disappointed that the intervention isn't seeming to do well, but in a, in a model, you may find that's to be expected, but you, know, you should see these gains on average over this time frame, and they should really pick up at this time. One of the best things in my view models, one of the areas where models are most underappreciated is that something a model can do, even if it's, even if it's got lots of uncertainties, is tell you roughly how soon should you expect reliable um, gains from an intervention. Because too many interventions in this world have been declared dead and buried and basically discontinued simply before their natural time to show benefit. And with a model, we can put figures on that natural time, say this needs to be in place for at least you know, eight years before we'd expect to see any benefit. And we may see variable you know, sort of uh, outcomes well before that. And we shouldn't be thrown off by that. That's something a stochastic model can give you. So I'm actually, I'm actually quite bullish, if you can see, about stochastic models. Now, stochastic models for this boot camp also bring up the opportunity of engaging what's called filtering, which is aligning a stochastic model's observations with the world and getting them always synced up um, and sort of uh, regrounded as to what's coming next. And, and that, that's also allowed by stochastic models. So um, I've worked a huge amount with deterministic models, stochastic models. I admire both. I think both are useful. But if I have my druthers, um, I find stochastic models give me a greater repertoire and greater, uh, um, a bit, and, and, and enhance my ability to address the needs of working with real world data. That's what I would say. I hope that's uh, helpful there. Um, how to choose initial values of parameters. Um, yeah, so when we talk about the word parameter, we, we distinguish a parameter, which is generally a fixed assumption from a state, which has an initial value and then evolves. So generally, if we have a value for a parameter at the start, it stays the same. It's a it's an assumption that lasts throughout the model. The initial state, by contrast, evolves over time. And choosing initial state, the initial situation with the model, um, uh, is something which uh, has many lines of, um, of, of support for it. In other words, there's several different ways you can go about choosing initial state. Often. You know, we have some data about the current situation and we use that data to parameterize our assumptions in the model to kind of put in place those, those, that initial state assumption. But uh, there are times where we don't have that. Um, and um, one thing that 
people will sometimes do is, is run the model through what's called a burn-in phase for a while so that the initial state, the vagaries of the initial state are forgotten. And then you assess things after that where you're really looking at substantive sort of trade-offs um, um, after some period of time, say after a five-year burn-in period or what have you. So the initial state is kind of forgotten by then. It caused transients, but they're forgotten. Another thing is sometimes you can run the model a, a while and, and get a kind of well-mixed state and put that in as your sort of assumed initial state. Um, sometimes we can also put in a distribution of possible initial states in a process that's of key importance in modeling called sensitivity analysis. And we can demonstrate the results from the model are robust given a wide variety of different assumptions about initial state. So sometimes we'll kind of have alternative initial states and show that at the end, they don't really, they don't really cause much difference in the results at all. Um, sometimes we can take what we see initially in terms of behavior and kind of back calculate the initial state. Uh, that's uh, another possibility. But um, those are some comments on initial state. For the most part, it isn't that bad because often, ladies and gentlemen, it's often not the initial state that really matters. It's, it's the dynamics that govern the evolution of that state subsequently. And often, you know, the initial state, it is true that it affects things some, but the really big picture impacts on intervention effectiveness or what's coming up down the road are often driven by the governed the behavior that governs the system over time, the dynamics of the situation. And uh, that is something that often is driven more by model structure and to a certain degree by parameter assumptions than it is by the vagaries of the initial state. Um, so initial state is something which sometimes has uncertainties around it, but often it, it doesn't in the end become you know, a key driver of findings um, uh, on the initial state. There are exceptions. I mean, it makes a big difference if you're dealing with infectious disease. If you have no infectives initially um, or, or, or you know, some, um, well, or it can make a big difference. But if you have people flying in every day from all across the world who may be carrying infection, maybe that doesn't even make a difference that much because it's more the rate of arrival of people who could be infectious from outside. So anyway, I hope that's useful. Um, uh, how do you please explain, uh, can you please explain what it means for theory when the model structure fails calibration? Yeah, so here's the deal. Uh, we saw an example where we started with a theory, a model structure that structure captures theory. It's, it's capturing theory. And we saw this initial structure, it's susceptible infected recovery, these stages of infection, natural history of infection. And we saw that that could yield behavior, that structure could induce behavior, give rise to behavior that match that sort of empirical data we saw, that yellow curve. And, and so it could, you know, by finding parameter values, we could adequately match that observed data. But uh, we found that when we changed that structure, we added this waning of immunity transition. Now we had a hard time accounting for that that an initial structure, or sorry, for that, uh, you know, of matching up against that empirical data. It just didn't jibe with it. It didn't match up with it. Um, and um, um, that's, uh, you know, that's a, a sign that something is off here, typically with your structure. There's some structural assumption, some assumption about your theory that, uh, that's embedded in your theory has motivated you to put in place a structure that just doesn't allow the behavior that you want to see. No matter what parameter we, we, we assume, we just can't get it to match what, um, what's observed. And that's a sign that often your theory needs to be, you know, is be, that's, a, that's a challenge to your theory. It's a sign that you need to 
re-examine parts of your theory and elaborate it and maybe, you know, um, uh, refine parts of your theory or, or question it, try an al alternative structure that might be reflective of a different theory. And that le leads to what's sometimes called structural sensitivity analysis. Um, so when a model just can't match over a wide variety of parameter values, the observed data, often it causes us to rethink whether our theory, you know, is, is indeed capturing um, um, th the regularities of the situation in the world. And we may have to, to rethink that theory. So it leads us to, to consider alternatives to the theory, which is what models are, they're learning tools. One place they're a learning tool is when we're designing structure and we gather people around the table and we, we critique that structure. Another place is when we run the model and we see first results and people on the team say, I've never seen that before. That looks really weird to me, or that's totally different from what I see, or, oh, we used to see this, but now we no longer do. Or, you know, um, oh yeah, oscillations like that occur quite a lot, but it's only under these circumstances. So you bring that knowledge from the team. But in other ways, you, you compare it with actual data and you find uh, how close it is to it. That's what calibration is about. And that's an aspect of model learning. Hopefully that's, that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions about this? Okay, well, um, time is, is short here and, and we had actually scheduled uh, lunch to be in in five minutes, I'm, um, uh, I, I think what I'll do is I'll just make a few, uh, a few brief comments then about um, uh, this example that I was going to give on maternal immunization for pertussis. Uh, it's actually a rather, um, rather uh, pleasing little um, uh, example because it illustrates many features of dynamic modeling and, and its relationship to data. But I'll just comment briefly on it in light of the limited time here. So um, I think what I'll do is stop the recording.